Hello everyone and welcome to another Cutrate Commander Precon Upgrade Guide, the series where we take a look at Precon decks and bring them up to Cutrate standards. My name is Grazit, and today we'll be looking at the Blast from the Past Precon from the Universes Beyond Doctor Who set and its face commanders, the Fourth Doctor and Sarah Jane Smith, which we'll be bringing up from its roughly $50 price point to an increased budget of $85 after upgrades. But before we continue, Continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content, and if you really like it, please consider supporting the channel directly, either through Buy Me a Coffee or through our Game Nerds affiliate link in the description. Also, if you haven't done so already, be sure to check out the ongoing 15k subscriber giveaway either on the card on this video or in the link in the description to enter for a chance to win a Bernard Ginger Sculptor Commander deck and to unlock sweet upgrades for it. So, with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commanders and playstyle. Starting off with the 4th Doctor, he's a 4-4 Time Lord Doctor that costs 2 and Simic that has the following abilities. Firstly, he passively allows us to look at the top card of our deck at any time, and secondly, once each turn, he allows us to play a historic land or spell off the top of our deck, creating a food token when we do so. Then his companion, Sarah Jane Smith, is a 2-1 human detective that costs 1 and a white, and, whenever we cast a historic spell, has us investigate, limited to once each turn. Taking a look at their core stats, the Doctor is sporting a mid-weight CMC and average stat block for his cost, while Sarah has a low-to-the-ground CMC and a low-toughness stat spread for hers, and their abilities, when combined, allow us to generate value off of any historic spells we cast by creating artifact tokens as we cast them. Breaking down the Doctor's abilities first, they simply serve as a once-per-turn historic-themed future site, enabling us to treat our top deck as an extra card in hand so long as it's a historic land or creature, and, as a bonus, increases our artifact count by creating a food token when we play it or cast it. Now, while it is true that we are limited to using this ability once per turn, it should be noted that it specifies each turn, not just our turn, allowing us to take advantage of of sources that let us cast our spells at flash speed in order to cast multiple spells off the top per rotation, and creating even more artifact tokens for us as we do so. Also, the fact that he creates a food for us every time we use his ability should not be overlooked, as while food is clearly not as good as some other types of artifact tokens we could be creating, our colors still have plenty of ways to take advantage of artifacts and tokens to generate value, and, at worst, we can use them to gain life at instant speed, which may be the difference between us stabilizing or being eliminated. Then taking a look at Sarah's ability, like her doctors, it creates another artifact token for us to use once per turn. This time a clue token, and she creates one whenever we cast a historic spell from anywhere, not just our top deck. Ultimately making her a bit easier to proc than the doctor, while still being able to take advantage of flash speed casting to get around her once per turn claws, and the clues she creates generally being more useful for us to crack since they generate us card advantage. So, as we can see based on their abilities, both the 4th Doctor and Sarah Jane Smith are commanders that care about historic spells, turning them into card advantage via allowing us to cast them off the top of our deck or by creating clue tokens as we cast them, while also being able to generate us a steady stream of artifact tokens for us to take advantage of, which the base build does a serviceable job at enabling via the good amount of legendary sagas and artifacts it contains out of the box, alongside additional payoffs for our historic heavy playstyle to work in conjunction with our commanders. Still, even with the amount of historic spells included here, the 4th Doctor's historic sight ability still feels a bit underwhelming since, while we do have a lot of historic cards, we don't actually have the critical mass of them needed to make the most out of his ability. So in this upgrade, we'll be aiming to rectify that by adding in even more historic cards to more reliably enable the Doctor's ability, particularly in the historic land department so he can help us make our land drops more consistent 
constantly, as well as adding in historic themed ways that allow us to cast our spells at flash speed to get around both of our commanders once per turn claws, enabling us to kick both of their card advantage and artifact token generation into overdrive. And speaking of artifact tokens, we'll also be expanding the number of ways we can take advantage of them, ranging from additional ways for us to use them to generate us value, to more ways to weaponize them so we can use them to bring down our opponents. Then, after adding in even more sources of artifact token creation, we'll be left with a build that can generate an insane amount of value and board presence that's worthy of the longest lasting doctor of the franchise. So let us turn back the clock to November 23rd, 1963, where at 5.16 Greenwich Mean Time on BBC One, Doctor Who first graced our screens. Following the adventures of the titular character, the British people quickly fell in love with William Hartnell's portrayal of the rogue Time Lord that traveled through time in a police box, running a mind-boggling 26 seasons across eight different actors between 1963 and 1989, each of whom left their mark on the franchise and made the role their own. And while these days, David Tennant and Matt Smith are arguably the most popular Doctors of the franchise, it's still important to remember that they walked a path that was blazed almost four decades earlier by actors every bit as important to this beloved franchise as they are. A series that has gone down in history as one of the finest British television programs, thanks in no small part to their efforts, and will hopefully continue to achieve greater heights than they could ever have imagined. So, now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's briefly go over the cards that made the cut from the core build. Starting off with what is undeniably the backbone of this build, its historic spells, we'll of course be hanging on to a good number of the ones included in the base build in order to both enable our commanders and to support our historic heavy playstyle. So, kicking off with the legendaries that made the cut, we'll be hanging on to all seven doctors included in the base build, both since it's thematically appropriate and because they all bring solid utility to the build for us to take advantage of. With the first doctor allowing us to fetch up the TARDIS when he ETBs, which also makes it into the build as a historic spell, enabling us to initially get two legendary spells for the price of one, and then synergizing very nicely alongside the TARDISes on a attack cascade to empower our board with plus one plus one counters while the TARDIS generates us value, the second Doctor's hand limit removal protecting us from overdrawing via our two face commanders, and whose end of turn draw not only generates us more card advantage, but also incentivizes our opponents not to attack us while we build up our board, the third Doctor serving as a payoff for our artifact tokens as his stat block increases alongside them, turning him into a trampling beat stick that also brings an extra token with him when he TBs, the fifth Doctor empowering our board of legendary creatures over time with plus one plus one counters, turning even our smallest legend into a legitimate threat while we build up our board, the sixth Doctor directly empowering our historic game plan by creating a non-legendary copy of the first historic spell we cast each turn for even more value and board presence, the seventh doctor serving as another artifact token payoff that, at best, allows us to cast a free spell each turn, or, at worst, creates an additional clue token for us to take advantage of instead, and lastly, the eighth doctor providing us with a repeatable source of historic reanimation, which, like our commanders, will also benefit from the flash speed casting additions we'll be adding to the build to get around his once per turn clause and allow us to reanimate multiple historic permanents per rotation. Then moving on from the Doctor and on to his companions, K9 Mark I will be retaining his position as both a cheap way to provide all our legends with soft targeted removal protection via his AoE Ward 1, and as a means to allow them to get in for damage on clogged ward states by making them unblockable. Joe Grant stays in as a means to grant over two-thirds of our deck cycling, allowing us to keep our clues intact if we have dead cards in hand and making herself bigger as we pitch them as a bonus. 
Jamie McRimmon keeps his spot, has a decent historic payoff, who can reliably make himself gigantic as we cast our historic spells to get in for solid damage. Tegan Jovanka makes the grade as either essentially a free 3-3 attacker each turn, or as a means to protect another one of our historic creatures as they swing in by making them indestructible. Ace Fearless Rebel preserves her spot thanks to being a repeatable fight effect and an ever-growing threat thanks to our artifact token creation every time she swings in, to both keep the pressure up and the board clear. Nissa of Traken maintains her position as a way to turn our artifact tokens into mana-less draw while tapping down our opponent's creatures as she does so to enable very safe alpha strikes. And lastly, Perry Brown also makes it into the final build as a repeatable way to allow our creatures to help us cast our historic spells by granting them Convoke, allowing us to cast the spells off the top of our deck or that we draw into even faster. And then to wrap up our retained legendary creature base, we'll be holding on to Alistair the Brigadier as a powerful historic payoff, who initially serves as a way for us to build up our board state with token bodies while we cast our historic spells, and later serves as a powerful AoE pump effect that can easily grant our entire board a plus 20 plus 20 or higher stat bump thanks to our artifact tokens to close out games, as well as Dugan Private Detective, who gives us even more clues to build up our our historic count with as he comes down and attacks, while also typically being at least a 5-5 thanks to our repeatable sources of card advantage, and being able to take advantage of that stat block by turning it into a one-sided fight effect to deal with almost any creature. Now, as a few more non-creature legendaries we'll be holding on to, we have Bessie the Doctor's Roadster, which is a simple way to make our legendary creatures evasive if we need them to get safely in for damage, 500 Year Diary, which can provide an insane amount of mana for us as we stockpile our clue tokens to help us cast more spells, and Hero's Podium, which serves as a fantastic legendary payoff that turns the overwhelming majority of our creature base into beat sticks the instant it comes down, and, on top of that, also lets us repeatedly dig for more legends to build up and empower our board state even further. And then as the final two legendaries that we'll be carrying over from the base build, we have the legendary lands, Gallifrey Council Chamber, and a Trenzalore Clock Tower both of which enable our commander to make our land drops off the top of our deck, while also providing additional utility via either serving as a decent source of fixing for all the Time Lords we'll be running, or by slowly building up into a Time Twister so we can recycle our deck and graveyard while reloading our hand. Then switching gears from one historic category to another, we'll also be holding on to some of the sagas included in the core build to help further our game plan while enabling it, such as an unearthly child to repeatedly help us dig for the various doctors and companions we'll be running, City of Death as another source of artifact token creation in the form of treasures, which later turns into a way for us to multiply the artifact tokens we have in play to reach a critical mass of them easier, Trial of the Time Lord as either temporary or permanent non-destruction creature removal against multiple targets, and a Knight of the Doctor as a historic themed board wipe that may also level our board, but at least lets us reanimate one of our legendaries later with an additional keyword counter on it to help us rebuild our board. And lastly, as our final category of historic carryovers, our artifact suite will consist entirely of the mana rocks included in the base build, all of which help us speed up and or fix our mana base to ensure we'll be able to reliably cast our spells and crack our tokens, while occasionally providing us with some additional utility via cantripping, removing our hand size, or providing some extra modes for us to take advantage of. Then, with all our retained historic cards covered, we'll also be hanging on to a handful of non-historic payoffs to help us get even more mileage out of our build, those being Displaced Dinosaurs, which is too good not to run considering it turns every single artifact token we create and historic spell we cast into a 7-7 while it's in play to overrun our opponents with, and Twice Upon a Time, which initially serves as yet another way for us to search up our doctors, and then later provides us with an extra turn that we can use to finish off our opponents once we've weaponized our tokens. 
We'll then be keeping in some additional non-historic entrants to help us build up our removal suite, such as Path to Exile and Swords to Plowshares to give our otherwise slow build some efficient flash speed interaction to help us deal with our opponent's creatures, as well as reverse the polarity to give us some more interaction in the form of spell disruption that we can, alternatively, use as a niche AoE combat trick by switching all creatures' power and toughness, or as a way for us to enable Alpha Strikes by making making all our creatures unblockable. And lastly, as our only other non-historic spell carryover, Heroic Intervention makes the cut as a cheap and efficient way for us to protect our entire board from board wipes and targeted removal, which is fantastic to have in our back pockets just in case our opponents have the means to disrupt our game-ending alpha strikes. Then quickly going over our retained mana lands, we'll of course be hanging on to Command Tower, Seaside Citadel, and Path of Ancestry, as lands that tap for all our colors to help improve consistency, with the last one also providing decent repeatable card selection considering how many Time Lords and humans we're running, Exotic Orchard as an untapped land that taps for most if not all our colors off our opponent's lands, both Horizon lands and both Filter lands included in the base build as more untapped fixes to build up our mana base with, and the check land, the battle lands, the reveal lands, and the slow lands included in the core build as even more fixing that can situationally come into play untapped to give us even more access to our colors without sacrificing too much speed. And lastly, we'll be keeping the two planes, two islands, and three forests included in the base build as our basics to round out our mana base with. That leaves us with a final tally of 65 cards including basic lands that we'll be keeping from the base build, leaving us with 35 cards to replace, which is admittedly a lot, but considering 10 of these changes will be made to our land slots make the overall changes a bit more manageable. So, now that we've covered all the cards that made the cut from the core build, let's move on to our upgrades. Starting off with the new historic additions we'll be adding to the build to more easily proc both of our commanders, we'll begin with a fresh wave of legendary entries that further enable the build's historic and artifact token focused game plan. In the former camp, we'll be cutting the interesting but excessive Dr. Tudor The Five Doctors and the off-theme board wipes Time Wipe and Crisis of Conscience so we can add in the flash speed granting legends Raf Capuchin Ship's Mage, Sally Sparrow, and Gandalf the White in their place each allowing us to bypass our commander's once per turn clause to get even more value out of them via granting flash to our historic spells, our creature spells, or our legendary and artifact spells respectively. Then moving on to the artifact token generation side of things, we'll first be supplementing our foo token creation by removing Ian Chetterton and Barbara Wright, both of which lack the critical mass of sagas needed to make them super effective in this build, and replacing them with Peregrine Took and Samwise Gamgee, both of which serve as repeatable sources of food as we either create tokens or summon creatures, while simultaneously acting as food payoffs by letting us sack our food to turn it into draw or on theme recursion, cutting Adric, mathematical genius, who's less good in this build than he could potentially be due to being unable to copy our commander's once per turn effects, so we'll be replacing him with Astrid Peth, who provides us with even more food production as she ETBs and swings in, while also growing herself with counters as we crack our food and clues, and the two enemy draw focused Leela Savatim Warrior losing her spot to the Goose Mother, who gives us the option to pump a lot of mana into her to flood the board with food and have her come in as a gigantic evasive beat stick, or simply cast her for two and use her as a repeatable way to turn our food into card advantage at no mana cost. Then pivoting to clue token generation, we'll be slotting out the symmetrical card drawing Sergeant John Benton so we can slot in Lunis Cryptozoologist, who tacks on ETB clue token creation to every creature we summon, and lets us sack our clues to permanently steal spells off our opponent's decks at no mana cost, as well as replacing the token copying Romana 2, who would be much better off in a build that creates big impactful tokens rather than treasures and food, with Tamiyo's journal, 
whose passive clue token generation is decent enough, but whose real draw is its ability to turn our excess clues into a tutor to fetch up anything we may need to our hand, which is a fantastic way for us to reliably gain access to our flash speed enablers, payoffs, and finishers. Then, with all our new legendary artifact token creators covered, let's move on to some legendary swaps we'll be making that can take advantage of said tokens. With the plane chase specific mana dork Susan Foreman losing her spot to Jahira Friend of the Forest, who turns all our artifact tokens into green mana rocks to skyrocket our mana production as soon as she hits the board, the two insect focused Vristrin Monopta leader being benched in favor of Rosie Cotton of South Lane, who takes advantage of our artifact token creation to steadily empower our creatures with plus one plus one counters, and the way to doctor specific win con Gallifrey Stan which really belongs in a build featuring all the Doctors, being switched out for Mary, Warden of Isengard, who tacks on some 1-1 bodies to our token creation and, like our commanders, gets even better with our flash speed enablers to get around his once per turn claws and build up our board even faster. And then, just to add in a handful of ways to generate some additional value off of the Doctor's top decking since we've made it much more reliable, we'll be replacing the on-theme but non-legendary draw source Traverse Eternity with the legend Vega the Watcher, who tacks on draw to every spell we top deck to help us dig for our payoffs and finishers while proccing and benefiting from said payoffs and replacing the decent legendary themed anthem Day of Destiny with the more artifact token focused Osgood Operation Double, who, thanks to creating a non-legendary copy of herself when she ETBs, allows us to create two more clues whenever we cast a spell from our top deck so we can stockpile more artifacts, and also generates enough mana for us to crack a clue each turn for even more card advantage. And finally, as our last pair of new legendary spell additions, we'll be cutting the decent but generic removal spell Return to Dust in favor of the Pandorica, which is slower but does enable our commanders and game plan better while being infinitely more annoying, especially if we're able to phase out our opponent's commanders, and the much too weird removal saga The Curse of Fenric being slotted out so we can slot in Weatherlight, which provides more mana-less on theme card advantage and card selection while also having the additional benefit of clearing our top deck if we can't cast it to hopefully hit something we can cast. Then, as our last new wave of legendaries, we'll be introducing some legendary lands to the build by terraforming the three Thrive lands included in the base build into the Shire, Rivendell, and Minas Tirith, each one making it more likely for the Doctor to hit them off the top while also providing some on-theme food token creation, card selection, and card advantage, as well as cutting the cycling land Ash Barrens for our last legendary land, the Grey Havens, which is functionally an on-theme scry land that gets better as our legendary creatures start hitting the bin by tapping for more colors of mana. Now, with all our new legendary additions accounted for, we'll be making two new additions to our sagas to further bolster our historic count while providing on-theme utility. The first seeing us swap out the two warrior-themed Saga The War Games to swap in the more legendary-focused War of the Last Alliance, which allows us to tutor up our legendary flash speed enablers and our payoffs to improve consistency, and culminates with a powerful Alpha Strike enabler in the form of AoE Double Strike for us to crack in with, and the second having us cut the non-historic historic themed removal spell banished to another universe for the proper historic removal spell Elspeth Conquers Death, which still exiles permanent threats while procking our payoffs, and provides further utility as it progresses by slowing down our opponent's casting and eventually reanimating one of our creatures if needed. And at last, reaching the final part of our historic tripartite, our artifact upgrades, we'll begin by adding in some more artifact tokens matters payoffs to help us generate more value off of and or weaponize the tokens our commander and other sources create, with the Voltron equipment piece Hero's Blade being exchanged out for Academy Manufactor, which single-handedly triples our commander's token production as soon as it comes down to make stockpiling our artifact tokens significantly 
slightly easier. The base builds other Voltron piece, Ace's baseball bat, being shelved so we can add in Cyberdrive Awakener, which serves as a near-perfect finisher for the build by allowing us to turn all our artifact tokens into evasive 4-4s the turn it comes down to Alpha Strike our opponents out of nowhere, and the on-death Doctor replacing Time Lord Regeneration being replaced with Idol of Oblivion, which provides repeatable card advantage that synergizes perfectly with our constant stream of artifact tokens tokens. Then from there, we'll be modifying our ramp package slightly by replacing the land ramp sources Explore and Three Visits, along with the Stun Counter Multiplying Saga, the Caves of Androzani, with the Mana Rocks, Talisman of Curiosity, Relic of Legends, and Inspiring Statuary. The first just being an overall more reliable source of ramp, the second, while more expensive, still provides serviceable ramp and fixing on its own, while also turning all our legendary creatures into any color magic mana dorks to speed up our mana base considerably, and the last allowing us to use our artifact tokens to help us cast our spells instead for yet another spike to our mana production. And then, as one last wave of historic lands to help optimize our Doctor's historic site, we'll be cutting both Bicycle Lands, the Man Land, and the three Scry Lands from the base build so we can add in the Artifact Lands, Ancient Den, Seat of Synod, Tree of Tales, Razor Tide Bridge, Tangle Pool Bridge, and Thorn Glint Bridge all of which increase our odds of hitting historic lands off the top and occasionally synergize with our artifact payoffs as further upside. And finally, as our last and only new spell addition that's not historic, we'll be replacing the strange token creating and removal saga The Sea Devils with the artifact payoff Rise and Shine, giving us one last way to weaponize both our token and non-token artifacts by permanently turning them into an instant army of 4-4s four when we overload it, which should be more than enough to overrun our opponents with. So, now that we've covered all 35 cards that we've upgraded from the core build, let's take a look at the breakdown for this precon upgrade. This deck currently has 34 creatures including our commanders, 4 instants, 2 sorceries, 6 enchantments, 18 artifacts, 0 planeswalkers, and 36 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 69 cards that are considered historic, 12 cards that care about historic cards, 42 cards that are considered legendary, 11 cards that care about legendaries, 16 cards that can produce artifact tokens, 19 cards that care about the artifact tokens we create, and 3 cards that let us cast at flash speed leaving us with a build filled to the absolute brim with historic spells and lands to enable our commanders, payoffs for both the legendary and non-legendary aspects of the deck to generate us value, plenty of artifact token creation to supplement our commanders and ways to weaponize said tokens for value and damage, and even a handful of ways to further enable our playstyle by enabling us to cast some or all of our historic spells at flash speed to bypass our commanders once per turn clause. Then for general deck stats, we have 16 ramp sources, 19 card draw sources, 8 targeted removal sources, and 1 board wipe. Our ramp and draw being much higher than average due to our treasure and clue token generation bolstering those numbers, while our removal and wipes are slightly lower than average due to us being more focused on accelerating ourselves rather than disrupting our opponents. Looking at our mana curve, we have 4 1 drops, 16 2 drops, 18 3 drops, 15 4 drops, 5 5 drops, 5 6 drops, and 1 7 drop, leaving us with a mid-weight curve that aims to drop Sarah on board as quickly as possible, followed by historic spells to get her clue token generation online, and then dropping the doctor to allow us to generate value off the top of our deck as well while creating even more artifact tokens. We'll then be aiming to cast or play as many cards off the top of our deck as possible, amassing more and more artifact tokens as we do so, until those tokens either achieve the critical mass necessary to mass animate and overrun our opponents with, or generate us enough value alongside our historic spells to let us run away with the game. 
The final price of this build then comes out to be $85.42 after upgrades. This price does not include tax or shipping and assumes that the price you paid for the precon was $50. The price of the cards was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. Now, for side grades, we could consider replacing Vega the Watcher with the 13th Doctor if we'd rather have another way to empower our board as we cast cards off our top deck instead of just drawing more, or swapping out Relic of Legends for Tireless Provisioner if we don't mind reducing our historic count in order to improve our artifact token creation. And then, for further upgrades, we can exchange War of the Last Alliance with Vidalcan Orrery to give us another historic way to cast our spells at flash speed now that it's at a more reasonable price. Joe Grant can be benched in favor of Reki History of Kamagawa to provide us with more reliable card advantage as we cast our legendary spells, and Weatherlight can be sidelined for Urza Lord High Artificer to give us yet another way to turn our artifact tokens into mana rocks that we can then use to cheat additional spells into play. But if we really want to push our wallets to the breaking point, we can give our land base a legendary glow up by replacing any of our non-historic lands with the somewhat reasonably priced Iganjo Seed of the Empire, Ottawara Soaring City, and Iganjo Castle. The significantly more expensive Minamo School at Water's Edge, Boseju Who Endures, and Urza Saga, or, if we have reserve list money, Gaia's Cradle as a way for us to flex on our opponents while we wonder how we're going to be paying our bills. So, now that the blast from the past precon has been covered, let's wrap up these precons by flashing forward to the Doctor's latest incarnations and covering the Paradox Power precon along with its face commanders, the 13th Doctor and Yasmin Khan. So look forward to a non-traditional casting build featuring these two coming soon. In the meantime though, be sure to check out our currently ongoing at the time of posting this 15k subscriber giveaway, where we'll be raffling off a full commander deck being helmed by Bernard Ginger Sculptor built by yours truly, and, as is tradition, giving you the opportunity to unlock some sweet upgrades for it depending on how many new subscribers the channel gets and how many likes the video gets before the drawing on November 15th. So either click on the card in this video or on the link in the description to go to the video where you can sign up for your chance to win. And again, thank you all for your support for having helped the channel reach this milestone, as we wouldn't have gotten here without all of your support. And lastly, before we close out, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel can't continue to grow without your support. And if you're feeling particularly generous, feel free to keep me caffeinated via buying me a coffee at the link in the description, or alternatively, use our Game Nerds affiliate link in the description if you're looking to purchase sealed MTG product, accessories, board games, or any of their other wide selection of products at low prices that include free shipping for orders over $75, and a rewards program that builds up store credit over time as you make your purchases. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the Cutrate Commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.